it's promising. Yeah. Yep, we're there now, I think. It's looking like it started on Zoom, on, on YouTube. Excellent. Okay, um, sorry for the delay, everyone. Gremlins. Welcome to the Astronomical Society of Edinburgh, wherever you are. Um, this is what we've got happening tonight. Um, just a few introductory slides from myself. And then our main talk this evening is um, Grant from Flow. I think that is his second name, Grant from Flow, uh, will tell us about their remote observatory, which should be really interesting. Um, we have um, a few members on Zoom here, and welcome to all our visitors who are on YouTube, wherever you are around the world. So let's um, get into this. Oh, yes, uh, we have quite a few new members. So uh, welcome to Richard, Andrew, Thomas, Jennifer, Elizabeth, and Ananya. So um, can we unmute and welcome them? Any of you are here tonight, but welcome anyway. Our membership has now gone up to 176, and that's growing um, rather quickly at the moment. You can stay in touch with us in um, all the usual ways. Our website has all the information you need about up and coming meetings, um, lots of information um, that's useful um, to new astronomers, lots of um, knowledge stuff and information about our um, introductory sessions that we do to astronomy as well. Um, we have a Facebook uh, group, Twitter, and all our meetings are recorded, all our public meetings recorded and put onto our YouTube channel. So you can see an awful lot of fascinating talks we've had uh, over the last few years, certainly during lockdown, worth, worth looking at some of those. Uh, this is the last um, meeting of the, of the current session. Um, after this, we have the whole of August off. Um, so you'll not be hearing very much about from, from us during that time, maybe the odd post here and there. But our next meeting, our next public meeting is on the 9th of September. Uh, that's that's a change. It's normally the first Friday in the month, normally the second, but it's the ninth this year because um, the church we meet in, the Augustine United Church in um, Edinburgh, will still be hosting Edinburgh Festival events on the second. So the first public meeting is on the ninth. On the 7th of September, we'll have our Imaging Observing Group meeting, and that's for all um, society members, and we, have, we hold that online. Um, but the 9th of September, the first public meeting, which uh, will be streamed online as well, will be about um, discovering an imaging planetary nebula from Peter Goodhue. On the 16th of September, we'll have an online only talk from Dennis Vida of the, the Global Meteor Network about um, meteor physics and the meteor cameras. Um, quite a few of us in the society now have these meteor cameras and, and how that global scale scientific instrument works. It's quite, quite an amazing system. 7th of October, the ground effects of space weather from Jerry Richardson, and on the 12th of October, another imaging and observing group. This time, it'll be um, specifically about radio astronomy. We'll have a, a guest speaker at that one as well. We have lots of other amazing uh, meetings lined up um, for the rest of the year and into, into next year as well that um, Nigel and his team has been working on. So lots of things to look forward to. And um, all our public meetings will be online and visitors are always welcome. They're always free. Um, if you haven't seen any of these pictures yet, I'm sure you all have, but I'm going to put them up anyway because the, the James Webb uh, images were just truly amazing. Um, is this one possibly the most important one, the, the um, exoplanet atmosphere? I don't know. Um, I don't think we can do that one from Spain to quite that detail, <laughs> Grant, but we can, we can always try. And then um, Stephen's quint quintet as well. The, um, the delivery of the, the, the uh, um, release of the images was um, not the best, shall we say, but the images were well worth the wait. They were fantastic. So, okay, that's it from me. So um, over to Grant um, and um, you'll um, know First Light Optics. We all know First Light Optics in the society, are an excellent retailer. Other retailers are available, but um, First Light are an excellent retailer with excellent um, customer service that we're all rather fond of here as well. So. Um, I'll stop sharing and um, over to you, Grant. Thank you very much.
Bear with me just a second. Um, thank you for the welcome. And it's uh, it's really fantastic to see such a society in healthy shape and with membership growing. I think that's um, very reassuring about the future of amateur astronomy in the UK, which uh, I'm <laughs> very, uh, very concerned with, as you can imagine. Um, so uh, tonight I'm going to talk about the Icarus Observatory, which is a project we've had going for a couple of years now. I'm going to talk about the first iteration of that and, and where we're up to now because things have moved on quite a lot and some of the stuff I'm going to talk about tonight you guys are the first to hear about it so uh, yeah that's um, so I'm going to talk about tonight um, I do work for First Life Big that's my my day job but um, I've been interested in astronomy for um, a long time since uh, a young boy uh, looking at um, meteor showers in the garden with my parents and um, while I was at university is when I actually learned what you could achieve in your own back garden and that was what really got me into astronomy um i became involved in stargazer lounge forum i was a founding uh, admin of that uh, i'm part of my local astronomy society uh, which is the lecturer from district astronomy society and um some of you might want to throw things at me for this but i uh, I, I built the clear outside website and the astronomy tools website so as well as first light objects i'm you know astronomy is my my passion so I'm very privileged that my day job is uh, is my hobby as well. Um, I wanted to share with you just my, that was my first proper setup. And uh, that is actually what I got paid for building the first uh, First Light Optics website is the set up on the left there. And uh, they're some of my first images from many years ago now using a digital SLR. So uh, yeah, things have come a long way. Just ignore the crate of beer. I keep meaning to uh, <laughs> hide that, but there we go. That's uh, That was it, a star party in Wales, a very, very wet star party in Wales. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about the Icarus Observatory version one. And um, this came about following a, uh, just a sort of internal chat with people here. Um, and Ian King works for us and he also runs the um, I see stars remote hosting in Spain and we kind of fancied the idea of having a remote setup and I certainly did and wanted some some more toys to play with so um, back in late 2019 we decided we were going to send um, a setup over to Spain um, the, the setup that Ian runs is was is full was full so we ended up using um, a partner site um, called Pixel Skies and I'll talk a bit more about that in, in, in the further in the talk um, the initial setup was a partnership with Opton Filters and Starlight Express. And, and really the idea was to have a remote setup that we could use as a test bed for equipment. We could use it as a way of showcasing equipment and getting data from equipment and as something that we can make um, available to the community through our, our sort of relationship with Stargazers Lounge. We wanted to be able to make data sets available and we had all these ideas about using it for scientific use as well, but that didn't quite happen. So I'll talk about that um, a bit later on as well so this was our first setup that we had on display at the IAS show to show people what we were sending over there um this talk is going to get quite geeky and nerdy and we're going to talk about products we're going to talk about geeky things so apologies if it gets very very geeky and nerdy but I'm told geeky and nerdy is good so we'll, we'll carry on with that so the first one uh said that we had was a 104 mil triplet refractor on a 10 micron gm1000 mount we were using a Starlight Express 694 CCD with a load star, which is still the, the best guide camera you can you can get. Um, with some Optolong filters, um, an optic flip-flap, which is the panel at the top, which keeps your telescope clean during the day, and you can use it as a flat panel, and then you can open it up at night remotely, followed by all sorts of other bits and pieces to make it all work. So that, that was where we started. Um, and we ran this um, for some time. This is uh, us sending a kid over there and this is Dave from Pixel Skies on the right looking at me because I forgot to send something with the rest of it. Um, so I had, we had a bit of a fail there. Um, Pixel Skies actually did a video of, of the setup. I'm not going to play it now because it's, it's quite long, but if you're interested in the steps they go through to set up a remote setup, it's, it's, it's very interesting watch. Um, <clears throat> it takes a lot of thinking before you send the kid over to Spain in terms of cables and cable lengths. And, and there's lots of detail. It isn't just sending the mount and, you know, the scope. There's, there's a lot to think about, which probably when you do it in your back garden, you, you, you know that you have all those bits, but when you're sending it remotely, there's a lot more thought that goes into it. Um, as I mentioned, we, we're hosted at Pixel Skies, which is a uh, hosting site in Southern Spain. And that's where Pixel Skies is. Um, it's, 
about five kilometers from, I can never say this right, so apologies, Cassia, Kas um, which is in Granada. Um, it's sort of in the middle of nowhere, so it's not the kind of place you would want to go on holiday, um, as you would hope. Um, and it's in a very dark location with, with just fantastic weather. It's an interesting place because the weather forecasts always get it wrong there. So if, if the weather says it's going to be cloudy, for some reason, it's often not. It's in its own sort of pocket, um, which is which is nice. They have very hot, dry summers, as you can imagine, and very cold winters. And what we've seen over the years we've been there is rather than having an odd bad night here and there, they tend to have one or two weeks of the sort of spring, summertime and one or two weeks autumn, winter time where is bad weather for a sort of one or two week period but then the rest of the time it's, it's it's pretty amazing i mean i was looking earlier just to give you guys an idea and uh, as of july every night it's been open so far in july and in june i think we only missed one or two nights of bad weather um so we are you know compared to the uk we are spoilt here's what it looks like um yeah some kind of utilitarian looking boxes but um the roofs roll open and the way it was is controlled by Pixel Skies is they are responsible for the roof opening and closing. They monitor the weather. They have all the systems in place, and the telescopes are all designed to be a height whereby the roof can close at any time without having to park your scope, just for safety reasons. They can't wait for someone to park their scope, so that's that's the kind of rules with remote hosting. Um, there's internet there. There's power there, and we'll go through some of that in a bit more detail. Um, but as you can see, it's in a you know middle of nowhere and uh, you can see in that picture it's just just how nice the skies look um, there's another picture of the of the free enclosures that pixel skies have currently um, and you can see the setup we had there in the middle um, surrounded by by the other rigs and how it works is you basically pay a monthly hosting fee to have your rig there and have an allocated amount of space and power and internet and what you send over is kind of largely up to you um, as long as it fits within that space window and um, I've got to say, Dave, Dave in particular at Pixel Skies and Colin, but Dave in particular is the one we deal most with, has been absolutely amazing. And um, I felt very guilty with our first setup in that the first, after sending it to Spain, the first time I logged in, it was all there ready to go. And, and Dave does a fantastic amount of work to not just physical work either. He will help with the software setup and the configuration of Secret Generator Pro and computers and all that kind of thing. So it, it's it's quite an amazing experience and uh, it hats off to, to Dave for the help he gives us there. So here it is. Uh, again, you can see the flip flap that I mentioned before in its up position there on the right. And um, here's the data sets that we produce for this. So this data is still there on that website if you want to go and download it. What we decided to do is make available the raw stacked and calibrated frames rather than each individual frame. And that is purely from a data point of view that giving away all the raw frames would just be so much data. And, and at the end of the day, most of us will stack and calibrate in the same way. So the, the raw frames are there if you want to go and have a play. We made these available as we progressed and we ran competitions on Stargazer's Lounge to see who could do the best job at processing them. Um, and we tended to aim, and this is what astounded me, was our, our minimum sort of aim was 80 to 100 hours of data. Whereas what I've been used to in the UK is I might be lucky to get two nights in a row and get 10 hours of data, you know, on a, on a, on a really good, good opportunity. Or, you know, you could spend a whole season trying to get 100 hours in the UK. So this was pretty amazing. Just this sheer quantity of data that we were able to capture in a short space of time. I was saying before the, the, the talk started, you know, even this time of year, we're getting five, five and a half hours of data at night. In the winter, it can be 10 hours maybe more depends on your tolerance at the beginning and end so yeah if you want to have a play with this data please please feel free it's all released under a creative commons license we want we wanted to just make it as freely available as possible and what i wanted to just do is show you the winners of each of those competitions so you can get an idea of the sort of quality of data so this is the, the first data release which was an m16 um obviously a, a classic target um what is also very nice about these competitions is just how different the processing can be on the same data set. And that really surprised me is, is the artistic element that comes into this. You'll see some of these names repeated here because for one reason or another, we had a, a few people who are just particularly good at processing and seem to, to win 
more often than not, but we had a lot of entries of each of these competitions. Um, there you go, Crescent Nebula. Um, hopefully, Zoom isn't messing up the compression too much and you're getting a nice view of these. Um, M17. IC59, IC63, goes to Cassiopeia. I love this object. I think it's an absolutely beautiful target. Uh, Propeller Nebula. M33, so we were trying to mix up some narrowband and some LRGB with some hydrogen alpha added in. Flip through these. I found this one incredibly hard to process. So my hat's off to anyone that does a good job on M81 and M82 trying to get that integrated flux in the background, I think is, is very, very challenging. So we run the first observatory for 18 months, two years, and it coincided with lockdown. Um, so it got a lot of use for both for data collection, but we did a lot of outreach for it. We, we did live viewing events with my local society and other, other groups. Um, and it, and it, it, for us, it worked very well. For me personally, it, it, particularly during lockdown, it was a bit of a sort of mental health lifesaver, I think, having having a project like this and having those that data to play with and having the social side with the outreach stuff was just fantastic. But there were some limitations. Um, one was I wanted more. <laughs> I wanted to change the kid over. And it's not as practical. Unfortunately, post-Brexit is not as practical to change the kid over as often because of the shipping and the duties and the custom side of it is, is more complex now. So we found that actually, once the gear was up and running, we didn't tend to change it around. Um, the other side is because we're in a shared enclosure, we don't have control over the roof. So what I found when I was doing the outreach stuff was often the, the conditions were not good enough for the roofs to open to do any imaging, but they may be good enough to do some outreach. You know, if you can see a portion of the sky or you can see the moon, that can be good enough to do a bit of outreach, but not enough for the roof to open. So we wanted control of the roofs um, and, and we wanted multiple setups as well. Um, we, we kind of, I, I, I say we, it, it's not we, I, I really wanted to have um, some different field of views. I really like the idea of having a planetary setup. So the opportunity um, came towards the end of summer last year um, to, to have our own um, enclosures. So Dave and his team, built these two new enclosures that are specific, specifically for us um, that you can see there which I think he's done a very nice job of photographing that um, but they are really really well built enclosures and they were built back end of last year probably took a little bit longer than we expected because of raw material issues and things of that nature um, and there you can get a better view there of the of the original structures on the right and then our two new enclosures on the left hand side there um, just got a little video to show you, which I think is very clever, how clever it is, the roof opening and closing with the little flap to give us a bit more field of view in that direction. So there we go. That's uh, that's how nicely they open. Um, I told you it's going to be geeky and nerdy. I, I, <laughs> I enjoy videos like that. Um, and then as we had a, one of it opening, we've got to have an obligatory one of it closing as well, just so we can show off Dave's engineering skills. Um, so yeah that um is fully automated um and i'm going to go a bit into detail of what it takes to actually so i'm not going to talk about the structure because we didn't build the structure the structure is with any remote host in place the structure is already going to be in place for you uh the roof mechanism is already going to be in place with you i'm sure dave would be happy to share any information about roof motors and rails and stuff if anyone's got any questions about that um, but i'm going to take it from that point onwards. So um, some of you may notice that these are a product we've begun selling and that's because we needed a load of them for us for our own use. So we have, we've, we're we basing the rig over in Spain on these mini computers. Um, they're very low power, they run on 12 volts, they're, they're relatively inexpensive. And actually for deep sky work, we find them really, really good enough, you know, with um, eight gigawatts memory, the quad core Intel processors work a treat. Where they are not so good, and we wouldn't recommend them for, is um, very high uh, speed planetary solar lunar work. Um, it, it works, 
but particularly for solar stuff where it's very, very high speed, you will very quickly fill up that hard drive and you may find the USB free speed is just not quite there, but there are other, you know, there's other specs available for that. So each rig has a UPS um, and that's because sometimes the, the power in Spain can be a bit flaky and the UPS just smooths that out and it acts as a precautionary measure as well. It's also there for if there is a power cut, the roof will automatically close. So that the mechanism will just close based on, on the UPS. Um, we use network switches for remote power control. So if a computer does misbehave, we can kill it from a network switch. So everything is hands off as much as possible. Um, this is uh, uh, to show you what the observatory control looks like. So we have a PC dedicated to observatory control. This is all done using Lunatico. Um, hardware, so we use the AAG Cloud Watcher to actually monitor the skies, the weather, the wind speed, all the things like that. <clears throat> we also use this weather display system, which ties into another weather station that's at the, at the site where we pull in the relative humidity and some other variables. And that all goes into a script on the Dragonfly, which controls when the roof opens, if it's safe for the roof to open, um, and will immediately close the roof if either the data is out of date or there's a spot of rain or anything like that. So once this is set up, by and large, you don't touch it. It just magically works. And you can see there, it tells you when the roof opens, when it closes. Um, you can override that. So as I said earlier, this allows us to go in and say, actually, I want the roof open, even though the weather's not quite right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chance it. Um, the only time you really have to tweak this is, is if you can change the reading. Um, so the sky temperature reading you can change the parameter at which that will actually go safe or unsafe so different times of year that differential between ambient temperature and sky temperature you, you sometimes just need to tweak that and so that's really um, all that needs tweaking and again Dave is a massive assistance to us here in getting this set up but if you're already using AAG stuff which I'm sure a lot of people will be it's exactly the same as you would use um, at home um, yeah, apologies, avert your gaze. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about how we do the internet. So we have our own network that's separate from the Pixel Skies network. Um, it uses a load balancing system when we use something called Hubland, which is a local point to point network system. It's slow. Um, the 30 meg download is not too bad. But for us, the issue is the upload speed because we're logging onto it remotely. So it's uploading to us and three megabytes upload is, is pretty slow. Um, it's okay as a backup and it's very reliable, but it's pretty slow. Unfortunately, our only, unfortunately, fortunately, whichever way you look at it, our, our, our only real choice, other than having 10 different individual satellite connections using traditional satellite, um, was Starlink. And you can see the Starlink dish there in that array. And this is a speed test from today, which is a 225 meg download, 40 meg upload, which is more than enough for our needs. And it's been very reliable. I know how contentious Starlink is, but it, it, it really is perfect for these types of scenarios. There is no other option, otherwise we would have taken it. Um, so yeah, apologies, but um, there, is a, there is some positive in Starlink. Um, the software we're using over there is predominantly SQL Generator Pro, um, and that's simply because that's what we had experience in using before. Um, we, we really like it. And there's been some, uh, some big improvements to it recently. It's, it's a very long standing piece of software. There's obviously, there's Nina now, there's Ecos, um, there's Voyager, which we'll probably trial again at some point. Um, the main reason like, we did trial Voyager, but the main reason we didn't use it was because Voyager didn't used to be able to handle sequences day to day. It would be able to handle your night, but it then wouldn't remember where you'd got to when you kick off the sequence again the next day. So it, it required quite a lot of fiddling around to, 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 to use it multi-night. The sequencer in Sequence Generator Pro, and its name, is very, very easy to use. Now, I very, I very happily give people a demo of that at the end of this talk if anybody would like to see more of Sequence Generator Pro. I mean, that's five talks on in its own right, so I won't go too deeply into Sequence Generator Pro, other than to say that controls everything about our imaging sessions. Um, focusing, go-to, sequencing, just guiding, everything. Um, on top of that, on some of the rigs, we use the SkyX, um, SharpCap, Autostacker, you will have heard of most of these, IMPPG for a bit of wavelet processing, ASIS Studio software, which it potentially we'll use later if we do get to do some live viewing. The live stacking software in that is, is excellent. 
planetary system stacker is an alternative to auto stacker but the beauty of planetary system stacker is it's very easy to batch and i'll talk about why that's important a bit later phd guiding we all know phd guiding it's bulletproof um the roof status app which is written by a customer of pixel skies richard lee and what that allows you to do is there's there's a disconnect um and it's an, it's an important point to understand if you're going to do remote stuff like this so just because it's safe and the weather system says it's safe it doesn't mean the roof is open so there is a delay um it's a 15 minute delay from when it goes safe to when the roof will open and the reason for that is if there's passing cloud what you really don't want is your roof opening and closing every five minutes so there's a little bit of a safety sort of buffer so the reason you have the roof status app is if you don't have access to the roof control software which you wouldn't if you're a normal sort of customer hosted customer you wouldn't actually have access to that pc the weather system would tell you it's safe and you might start to try imaging and you're seeing nothing and it's because the roof hasn't opened yet so that just lets you understand what the roof's actually doing and then and then obviously the lunatico software so here's here's the here's the gear we, we've sent over this time um so uh I'll go, I'll go into more detail on each of these but this is what we kind of started with a back of a napkin over a curry one night was we wanted a, a deep sky setup again similar to before but we wanted a bit more aperture and we wanted a larger sensor with a bigger field of view we wanted to try some ultra narrowband filters and because we are now um, the uk distributors for paramount we actually wanted to use some paramounts to actually put our money where our mouth is and, and show people um, what a paramount can do um, we also wanted a planetary setup and i think that's very unusual i don't know of anyone else that has a remote planetary setup so we've started with a 10 inch classical casagrain with a really long focal length uh, with a planetary camera and um, again using a paramount we also then wanted a really wide field setup so i wanted to be able to get you know big big chunks of the sky so very short focal length with a good size chip but it needed to be lightweight because what we wanted to do was piggyback it on the planetary setup because the planetary setup isn't something you're going to use every night so hopefully by combining a wide field and planetary setup together then on any given night it will be doing one or the other and then what i'm most excited about is a solar setup because i again i don't know any amateur level people that have a remote solar setup and um we're, we're a little bit behind schedule on that and i'll explain why later um but the idea is going to be that we have a white light and a large aperture quark set up with multi-bandwidth and that's on an iaptron sem 120 so you can see we're trying to use kit that we want to you know showcase and show off but also kit that we want to get data from so we can you know test it and stand behind it um so that's that's that was our starting point here are the first two setups in in enclosure one so we've got our deep sky setup on the left there and then our, our planetary wide field rig on the right there and i'll just go through the key key bits of what they all are so we've gone for a William Optics FRT132. Um, we considered the larger six inch, but actually because of the space constraints, that was what we decided to go with. Um, started off with a 0.72 flat and a reducer, which I'm, I'm kind of regretting this time of year because I think actually there's more objects that be suited with it at its nat natural um, focal length. So that may be something in future years that we swap the flat and uh, the reducer in and out at different times of year, depending on you know, the targets we're after. You can see the Paramount Mighty. Uh, you can see another trusty old optic flip flat on the front there. Um, and this 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 setup has got a tw an ASI twenty six hundred, so it's an APS-C size set CMOS. And I am absolutely in love with the twenty six hundred. It's a, it's, a, it's a sensor I used here before we sent it out to Spain. And I think that the the size of field of view and the sensitivity, it's it's just an amazing chip. You know, no amp glow, and you'll see. Some issues about going later on a different setup it really is a, a phenomenal chip i'm sure you guys will, will, will know that by now already it's um it's proven to be very very popular we went for a 174 as our guide camera on that one but actually i think we easily could have got away with an asi 120 i think that was just again we just wanted to try something a bit different we're using a pegasus focus cube at the moment and we're using octolong filters uh our lovely b-link mini pcs and the high-tech astro Mount hub pro are uh, doing the computer control and the high the, the map hub pro is acting as our power control that's pretty much all it's it's doing um because in sequence generator pro you can have it turn things on and off at the beginning and end of a sequence um dave isn't keen and, and he makes a very good point of of camera callers being left on during the days 
obviously you can imagine the heat in Spain. If the camera cooler was left on, you're going to burn out your cooler pretty quickly. So um, that, that allows us to switch that all off in the morning at the end of the sequence automatically. Um, the piers are built by a supplier over in Spain nearby to Dave. Um, they work, they work well. I'm, I'm never keen on the studs on the piers, but that's just a personal preference thing. Um, but they, they certainly do the job. So this is our one of our first bits of data from this setup. I just uh, haven't got completed data sets to show you on these new setups. They are very new. We're kind of going through a testing phase at the moment. This is a single stretched five minute hydrogen alpha sub um, of elephant's trunk, just to give you an idea of the field of view, the quality, you know, that there's no calibration there. And I think that, that to me, that says quite a lot about the quality of the camera and, and how clean the optics are as well, <laughs> surprisingly. Um, so that's our wide field setup. Our planetary, uh, sorry, that was our deep class setup. Our planetary wide field setup is using a Stellar Lyra 10 inch classical Cassegrain. It's actually a truss design, but we've got it wrapped in a shroud there just to try and keep out a bit of dust. Um, that's also on a, a Paramount Mighty. At the moment, we're using a 485 color planetary camera on the back of that. Um, but the, I'll talk a bit in, in, down the line about some, some changes we'll probably make to that in the future. On the top of that, <clears throat> as you can see in that picture, on the right-hand side is a little ASCAR FMA230, which is, there's, there's more rings and camera in that picture than there is telescope. It really is a tiny little thing, um, especially when we've got a big two-inch field to it. It's a bit ridiculous, um, but it, it's working nicely. We're using a ZWO focuser on that with a, a 3D printed kit from Deep Sky Dad, which allows you to focus it because it's got a rotating helical type focuser. And that's working very reliably. And we've got a, a Deep Sky Dad flip flat on the front of that. Again, you can see the sort of weird panel on the front. In that one, we're doing something a little bit different. Um, at the moment, we're using a, I don't, yeah, I have this there, a 294 color camera. And this is where we're seeing some amp glow. So we may change that sensor over. Um, I'm not sure how well a 2600 will perform on the back, but we'll probably give it a go. But we're at the moment, what I'm trialing is, is, a, is a load of different filters suitable for a color camera, just so we can decide which one on go and we're going to use, because we, we weren't quite sure if there would be any light pollution or gradients or, or whatever else. So we've been trying the L-Enhance, the L-Extreme and the L-Pro from Optolong, and then an IDAS MBZ filter, um, which, sneak peek, that's my favorite one so far um and the trusty old uh, b link again um so this is this is the first moon image we've had out of it i think um we need to uh, we're sending out some collimation gear to help dave um get the collimation absolutely spot on uh but i was pretty pleased with that considering it was done however many thousand miles away and it was stacked on the machine and, and just a broad data brought it down so um uh, shows a lot of promise. The challenge, I think, is going to be that we would like to increase that magnification. So that's the native. I'd like to also be able to barlow it. But, uh, you know, as you guys know, depending on the seeing, you might want to use a two times barlow, three times, and, you know, you might chance your luck at five times. Doing that remotely is a challenge, but we might have a solution for that. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in, in a bit. Um, I'm really looking forward to some planetary stuff on this, but at the moment, it's still very early in the morning until the planets are up. And I'm once I go to bed up, I can't get up again, so um, that's going to have to wait until later in the year. Um, and there's another one as well. Um, this is a single frame from the wide field setup of uh, the North American Nebula, and this is using the MBZ filter that I mentioned. The reason I like this, so this is uncalibrated, just stretched, it's three minutes, sorry, not five minutes. Um, the reason I like the MBZ filter is that it gives a much nicer colour balance um, than some of the other sort of dual narrowband, tri narrowband filters that I've tried. Um, and I, I like, you know, I really like that color balance. Um, so again, I'm looking forward to when we get 100 hours of data on that to see where that comes out. Um, but it's a nice field of view with the 294. The only, uh, the only thing I have against it is it's quite a similar field of view to another setup I'm going to talk about with 2600. So it's, it's maybe not as wide field as I was hoping. So that might be why we stick a 2600 on it. So um, yeah, watch this space. Um, yeah, there's um, uh, there's the Veil Nebula, and this is again the three minute. This is using an L-Extreme filter. So as I said, at the moment, we're just experimenting, seeing what is gonna be the best combination of filters over there. 
I'm not as keen on the color balance. I know you can quite change the color balance later, um, so maybe it's not such an issue. But I, for me, I still think there's a bit more detail on the MBZ. But we'll see what the conclusion is once we've uh, got these first data sets. And there's the dreaded amp glow, which is another reason for wanting to to change the camera. Again, I know you can calibrate it out, but if you're doing live view and live stacking, it's often easier if it's just not there in the first place. This is our solar rig. Um, excuse uh, Rob's uh, workbench in the background. Um, um, this is based around an FRT 120 and piggybacked on top is a 102, which is going to be our white light setup. Um, and there's some really exciting innovation on this setup. The other setups, I guess, are a bit more traditional stuff you may have seen before, different combinations. But this is this is much more innovative. Um, we've worked with a company called Astron Scientific on their Rotarian device in partnership with Gary Power, who I'm sure some of you will know, to adapt their ro rotatory device, which is already on the market and is used to be able to rotate between eyepieces or different cameras. We've worked to adapt it to take um, Daystar quarks. And the really exciting thing about that is it's going to enable us to rotate between the quarks remotely to be able to do solar imaging in, in all four wavelengths plus white light on, on the same setup. Um, I've, I've made a slight mistake here, which is I've said we, we're going to use a B-Link mini C PC. We're absolutely not because it would probably mount on this setup, um, not physically, but just with the amount of data. We've, we've got a much beefier machine that's going to be used for this setup, which I'll, I'll talk about. There's a lot of other custom stuff going on here. We've got 3D printed parts. We've got laser cut parts that have all been done in our workshop. Um, uh, see if I've got a better picture. Yes, I have. There you go. There's the back end. So we've 3D printed a shroud to try and keep some of the dust and muck out of that, that rear end because otherwise the quarks are just left open. Um, so that, that's hopefully going to help. And we've got a clever little tape measure type mechanism power so that as it rotates, um, that, that goes with it. So um, have I got a video? There we go. Um, yeah, so that's what that's going to do. Um, I'll just flip back if I can. Um, yeah, so that's, um, that's the Rotarian uh, quark system. It's more than just rotating, it's worth saying, because otherwise I think some people dismiss it, oh, it's just rotating. It actually lifts itself up and down to accommodate the different sizes as it goes and also to, to, to close that gap as it rotates. So once the, it, it will lift, rotate, go back down to bring the camera back in close into the correct position, eliminating that gap where otherwise you might get some reflection or light entering. So it's a clever, clever bit of kit. And this is the first of its kind um, to be used in this manner. So we're very excited about this. Um, we also have some very clever flip flats. So these are, we've retro engineered some of the Deep Sky Dad um, flip flats to, um, to put in what's called a, um, a flat cap. So when you're doing solar imaging, you can take flaps on the sun and this is using a diffused uh, piece of plastic. So again, by doing this, we can actually remotely take those flaps as and when we need to, and we can close up the telescope at the end to keep it nice and clean. So there's quite a lot of innovation gone into this. Um, it's very, very much a trial run. We don't know how it's going to work out. And unfortunately, it's been stuck in the van for the last month heading, heading over to Spain. But I'm very, very pleased to say all of the solar gear arrived today. So I don't have any work in progress to show you of that yet, other than to say it's, it's getting installed over the next week or two. And we really hope to have some data coming out of it over the summer. And um, I'm really excited about this because uh, there's nothing like it. The amount of data we should be able to get. And I really hope we can either push the software or the software is going to catch up to be able to do sequencing of solar stuff. Because I think the, the opportunity to do multi-wavelength animations over the period of a day automatically is, is phenomenal. But, I, you, you know, the data this is going to generate could be absolutely colossal. So this is where I'm going to get even geekier and nerdier than I have been, which is we have an absolute monster PC that we've we've built specifically for this solar rig. Um, the key bit being the Ryzen 9 5950, which is a 16 core CPU and the 64 gigabytes of memory. And then the two, two terabyte M2 SSD drives, which are one of the fastest drives you can get. Um, it is an absolute monster of a machine, um, particularly for a non-gaming machine. Uh, so we really hope this is going to do what we need it to do. 
the, the idea being that we're going to process in Spain, even with the Starlink and everything else, downloading hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes of data a day is not going to work. So we're hoping we're going to be able to do the stacking remotely um, and then just bring down the finished image at the end. And we're looking at doing the same for the deep sky to try and automate the calibration over in Spain and just download the finished data rather than all of the raw data. And then just in case we've spotted something super interesting and we do want to go back to the raw data, we're going to have two 16 terabyte drives um, on that machine as a sort of local buffer. And then the idea being that, you know, after a week or two weeks, if there wasn't something particularly exciting, we will get rid of flush out the original data and just have the, the stacked um, the stacked frame at the end. Um, this is all sort of unknown though. We don't know whether the water cooling is going to be enough over in Spain. Um, we don't know whether the speed is going to be enough. We don't know whether the USB 3 is going to cope and the heat and everything else. So this is very much a trial run. And I think over this summer, there's, there's a few of us that are going to be working on this to try and kind of optimize it and, and uh, yeah, get it into a, a good position. We're also concerned about half opening the roof or fully opening the roof of the observatory during the day, what effect that might have on our deep sky and planetary setup. So that's a bit of an unknown as well. Um, traditionally, all remote hosted places will not open the roof during the day. It's just, it just doesn't happen for this reason. So we're, we're treading on sort of new ground here and I'm, I'm very excited about that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where we've got to with the remote stuff. Um, what I wanted to do with this talk though, is I, I, I wanna be open and honest with, with you all because I don't want to make this sort of sound super easy and straightforward and everything. I, I wanted to talk a bit about the, the good, the bad and the ugly um, and the warts and all. And some of this stuff I probably shouldn't say as a, as a retailer, you know, we don't always get it right. Products are not always right, but these things happen. And I think it's important to, to know things happen and, you know, what some of the, 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 the fixes are. So the good, um, we've got a fantastic host in David Pixel Skies. I've got no experience of any other host and platform. So I really don't know if this is the norm for the type of service we get from Dave or, or just how exceptional he is, but he is extraordinarily responsive. He's helped us get out of lots of fixes and his, his knowledge, because he looks after so many setups, his knowledge of the software and remote imaging is phenomenal. So having a resource like a, a Dave, everybody needs a Dave, is, um, is absolutely amazing. The mounts, so far the two paramounts over there have been flawless. Starlink, I'm sorry to say, apart from buzzing overhead, has been flawless. Um, sequence generator has been fantastic for us. It had been before on the previous setup and it still is. And there's been a whole load of updates recently with Secret Generator around the ASCOM switch side of things, which has really helped our automation. And it means the kickoff every night and the shutdown every morning is now much easier. I don't, I still do because I like to, but I don't have to log in in the mornings and check everything is turned off. It just magically is. Um, the ASI software, the live stacking software, I think has been fantastic. I've really enjoyed using that. The 2600 cameras have been fantastic and the MBZ filter. The bad is kind of stuff you'd expect to see anyway. And some of it is because we didn't have the opportunity to use the Deep Sky setup in the UK before we sent it out. Um, so there was probably some tuning with back focus we should have worked out before we sent it to Spain. And in an ideal world, before you send any kid over to Spain, you would set it up in your back garden and run it for a few weeks and, and iron out some of those crinkles. Um, we didn't, and we relied on, on a Dave. Um, and the same with some tilt adjustment that we had. Um, we did mock up all of the setups in our workshop and um, Rob custom made a whole load of cables and custom lengths and a really nice loop. And then when Dave got it all, Dave did it his own way, which in retrospect was probably the correct way. So for example, he, he always makes sure the PC is on the very top of the computer. And we just in our um, naivety, I guess, put it underneath the scope and his view was then the, the heat gradient from the computer. Um, and just little bits like that, where it's just Dave's experience of remote setups meant he wanted to do it his way, where there'd be the less chance of snagging and everything else. And he's been there and done that. And Dave will, you know, that's part of what Dave offers is that setup and that cabling process. Disk space has been biting us a lot. Um, Previously, we used a CCD with much, much smaller frames and doing 20 minute exposures. 
Now we're doing three minute, five minute exposures and they're 60 meg each. You can imagine we are racking up so much disk, disk space. So our poor little B links for their two, five, six gig of, of space, I think actually we are going to upgrade them all and, and stick in a, they've got space for a second drive. And I think that's what we'll do is put at least a terabyte drive in. Um, we've had quite a lot of career delays in getting kid over to Spain. And um, a lot of that has been down to, unfortunately, Brexit and the custom side is much more complex. Um, prior to Brexit, it was much easier just to fire stuff over to Spain and, and not incur huge um, customs charges. So that's a bit tricky. It's not insurmountable, but it's just been a bit tricky. Um, the ugly is Windows updates. Windows updates, have uh, it did it to me last night. I was in the middle of life stack and then it just decided to reboot itself and installed an update. I know there's pludges and fixes to try and stop that and you can delay it but even so it's quarters out time and time and time again and it, it's so frustrating um maybe someone has a magic fix they can share with us to stop windows updates the trouble is in a remote setup like this when you're on you know a shared network we don't want to stop the windows updates completely and, and most hosting services have a policy around keeping pcs up to date to a reasonable um you know service pack level so we can't just ignore windows updates completely we do need to allow them through but it's controlling the time it happens. And even when you tell it the times to avoid, uh, I, I don't know, it just doesn't. So Windows updates is not my uh, my favorite thing. We've had um, we've had a hard drive corruption issue on one machine. Um, we don't quite know what happened, uh, whether it's to do with a Windows update or something, but just one of those things. We've had a focus and motor issue, which is why we're now using a, a Pegasus focus cube on our deep sky setup. We had, we had a step, we think it was a step and motor issue. We've sent a new motor over with um, the solar rig, so we'll see what happened there. But it was basically just losing its position. It was, we wasted numerous nights where the focus just wasn't sharp. And uh, a sequence generator thought it was sharp, but it wasn't. And it was because it was moving somehow or not moving enough during that autofocusing. So we, we sorted the backlash settings. It wasn't backlash. It was some, some fault somewhere, and we haven't quite nailed it. We had a camera failure. Um, whereby it just wasn't downloading at all and um, we've never seen that on a 2600 and trust our luck it was one of our ones you know that we sent over to spain it didn't have that issue in the workshop again just one of those things luckily we sent over a spare so that wasn't too much of a, a killer for us and we also had which we've never seen on a um, william optics flat eight we had a faulty reducer flattener and again it was the one thing that we hadn't tested before we sent out because they're normally bulletproof and I think, again, just take, making assumptions. And again, we wasted a lot of time diagnosing that, thinking it was a back focus issue, when actually it was just fundamentally a faulty reducer flattener. So uh, I'd really urge people to try and get things right in the UK before sending stuff out remotely. Um, Dave has been incredibly patient with us, but the, the issue sometimes is having to then send out another part, you know, that time delay and, and going backwards and forwards, you just waste waste time um so if you can avoid that absolutely do so that's that's kind of where we are um but i'm going to do i'm going to channel my best uh, steve jobs and say but wait there's more um we've not mentioned enclosure two so i wanted to just give you a little bit of a sneak peek of what we're doing with enclosure two and um forgive me if uh, i'm this is not meant to be an advertisement and uh, it won't be portrayed as such, but I'm, I just want to give you a sneak peek of what we've got planned, which is this experience with remote hosting has made us think entirely about how remote hosting is currently done. So at the moment, there's two schools of thought for remote telescope hosting. Um, there's what we've done previously and what we're doing now, which is you rent some space from somebody and you send over a lot of gear you know, typically 15, 20, 25,000 pounds worth of gear or more. You know, I've seen people with huge plane waves and all sorts, and you know, you can really rack up a lot of money. And then you pay the recurring hosting fee, and it's, it's an expensive endeavor. The other option is that you subscribe to systems where you basically request data. So I telescope and various others, SLU, there's various others where you have, it's a subscription model. The downside of that in my mind and the bit that i love most about what we've been doing is the direct access so with those models you go on and you fill in a form and say i want 10 exposures five minute exposures of luminance of this target i want 10 of rgb you know you actually you just fill in a form and then a week later two weeks later the data is there for you to download 
And that gives you access to absolutely phenomenal data sets. There's no doubt about it. It will be, you know, £50,000, £100,000 setups, and you'll get some amazing data, but you don't have any direct access to the capture of that data. You've got no control over when it happens, how it happens. You're basically just licensing data. So what occurred to, to us in the process of the remote stuff we've been doing is, hang on, but our customer base the vast majority are people that are putting stuff in their back garden and it's modest equipment. It's Skywatcher mounts and it's Spree telescopes. And, you know, it's not 15, 20,000 pounds worth of gear. It's modest gear. And they're putting it in their back gardens where they've got light pollution and weather issues. So we were, our concept was then, can we replicate that? Can we put modest equipment in a remote setting and make it available to people on a, on a rental model whereby they get direct access? And that's what, remoteobservatory.com is doesn't exist yet is is going to be so we have our first of these setups in spain at the moment in enclosure two and the idea being it's going to be very densely packed in with um we're hoping 14 maybe more maybe less of identical rigs identical mounts identical telescopes all set up in the same way that people can have direct access to on a subscription model but the key here is you will get access via a VNC to the computer. What software you install, how you use it, when you use it, what targets you do, what exposure, it's all up to you. You are still controlling it um, and you still have full, own, full ownership of what you produce out of it. So this is the first one of those and it's based on our Salamara 90 mil triplet telescopes. Um, that, this setup you see here is actually, I, I used this in my back garden for a few months before we sent it over to Spain, just so we could tweak and, and be absolutely sure. Um, it's using an Arctron SEM40 mount, so a very modest mount, you know, small, compact. Um, it isn't, it hasn't got 10 micron or paramount tracking abilities, but for that type of focal length and the type of sensor we've got on the back, it is more than enough. Um, it will come with either a 2600 color or mono camera. So we're going to give people the option of, of, of what they want. And you can see the rest of the specs there. Um, the key thing is we, we, we will come with Sequence Generator Pro and it will come with some training. So you will get some support getting it up and running. Um, but it's, it's, it's just trying to turn it on its head a little bit and, and, and offer people modest equipment, what they might normally have in their back garden or at a star party, but somewhere where you're going to have 200 to 250 clear nights a year in astonishingly good skies, accessed remotely. So sorry, I'm turning to marketing here, so apologies. Um, this is an example of a, a raw sub from, from that setup. This is using the L-Extreme filter. And as I say, I'm still playing around with which filter is going to be the best choice, but that gives you an idea of the sort of field of view we're, we're talking about. Um, that's a single five minute stretched but uncalibrated again um, and what we're working on at the moment is a is m16 um, which is again another five minute but this is with the l enhance filter um, yeah so hopefully that gives you an idea of uh, the sort of what we're what we're aiming for and where we're going in the future um, i'm sure there's going to be some questions um, at the end but i just wanted to Sort of end on, on on sort of forward look in the future what i'm hoping happens next and what we really want to do with this version two is some more science stuff and um, we totally failed with the version one at that we did outreach and we did data collection but we failed at the science and i think that's because it's not it's not my bag so hopefully we can find someone who, who's really into that a bit more and we can do some more science sciencey type stuff aquitation work would be great some commentary work would be great um i'd really like to, to use a, a remote spectros do some remote spectroscopy um which doesn't really happen at the amateur level yet so that's something we'd like to look at i also really believe that the local and the re remote stuff can coexist side by side i still have imaging gear here i still have visual gear here this remote stuff hasn't replaced any of that it's just an add-on it's an extra bit of the hobby for me and I think the key bit here with amateur astronomy, I think it's an incredibly broad hobby. And I think there's room for everybody. I think there's room for all sorts of astronomers. And I think anything that gets us outside looking up at the sky or remotely looking at the sky and, you know, looking into the wonder of space is, is only a good thing. So I don't see any, any of this replacing anything. It's all, you know, there's room for it all. So uh, that's, that's me. Cool. 
Thank you very much for that, Grant. That was fantastic. Before we, we get on to questions, can we just thank Grant for, for his talk? That was brilliant, really good. Thank you. Sorry for talking so much. No, no. <laughs> that's great. Um, I would say that's Astro Geek Heaven, actually. That's exactly where a lot of us live um, in, in that sort of space. Um, questions on, on Zoom, if you could put your name into the chat, Peter, if you can just monitor that and, and make sure um, that's done. And if you're on YouTube, if you can put your questions into chat there and Will will call them out if there's time for that as well. Um, yeah, I was going to ask you about, about the, the, the science side as well, because I'm, I'm I <laughs> off in, taking, as Ramsey's laughing at me, that's what he's put the comment in for. I started off taking the pretty pictures as well, but I'm more into the science side now. But I suppose there's no real reason why you couldn't do that with your deep sky set up. You're just putting in, you know, V and R filters and things like that. It's just what filters you choose to use more than anything else, isn't I, it? I think that's it. And I think that's what we're hoping to, uh, to offer people is the option on what filter they might want. But also in our, our own deep sky stuff, I hope to be able to offer it available to people. Um, I really hope as well not necessarily with us but just generally that we, we quite often get asked to tender for universities and things for, for large installations that are going in the UK which is fantastic don't get me wrong I don't want to not have big observatories being built in the UK but I wonder with some of these whether actually the remote options might be better for student for some of the university students particularly with the weather factor I mean that's that's what we're up against here isn't it um, yeah yeah, okay. yeah. Okay, Peter, can you see if there's any questions for us, please? I've got, uh, I've not got any specific questions here that I can find, to be absolutely honest. Uh, I did ask a specific one. Carry okay, on. Carry on. Is there any hope of um, fibre broadband reaching the observatory? Um, I don't think so. Um, I think it's it's much too remote where it is at the moment and the infrastructure. So I know some remote observatories do have fiber to the observatory and, and that would be the ideal um i think in this instance I, I don't know enough about the spanish sort of political infrastructure but i just don't think it's on the on the cards um and i don't think there's enough i don't think the pixel sky site itself is going to is going to increase in size enough to, to justify that expense for one site and i've got to be honest now the starlink thing is available whether we like it or not i don't think it's going anywhere um, and it, it, it does work. It really does work. So, yeah, um, it's our sort of guilty little secret. That one. Um, <laughs> it's not a secret any longer. <laughs> Ramsey, you had a question? Yeah, I was wondering um, if you did all the stacking um, before you uploaded the images, um, how do you reject the bad images? So that's a really good question. That's something we've been talking about um, at the moment is whether we wait until we get to the end of an imaging run, the 80 or 100 hours, and then stack. Or we've got a kind of an open question. One of you guys might, might know the answer to this, which is if we stacked each night's worth of data and took calibration frames at the end of that night, and then at the end of a two-week, three-week imaging run, then combine those how different would that be to waiting until we've got all the data and stacking it all together at once? I'm not sure the signal, you know, what effect it would have on signal to noise and, and things like that. Um, we were going to try it, actually. We were going to actually take one of our imaging runs and, you know, stack it by day and stack it all together and stack it individually and then combine and just see what, see what the reality is. Um, I'm sure there'll be some maths to suggest which is the right way, but that doesn't always um, pan out in reality. Well, it does, but you, yeah, you know what I mean. Um, the way the stacking algorithms and stuff work now. That anybody got an answer <laughs> to that well, question? The, the um, that 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 is a time um, spaced solution to that problem. In that, um, current thinking is towards composite um, data stacking of data, so you can reduce exposure times. And rather than have, like Grant said, 60 megabyte files to upload or download rather every night of your data, the, they'll be used, the soft people are developing now AI systems that can analyze each one of those 60 megabyte files, compose them, stack them into, almost zipping them into ready to download Smaller okay. size files. 
So like an intermediate step. Ah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, it's an interesting, I mean, at the moment with the rigs we've got over there, by the time I log in in the morning, it has all downloaded. It's not such an issue, but you can imagine once there's maybe 20 rigs running on that same Starlink, it might mean we, we need multiple internet connections to divide it up that way. What some hosting places do is they will throttle your upload speed to share it out equally, and they will encourage you to only upload during the day when people aren't trying to log on to actually use the kit at night. So the, the different places have different rules. Um, some remote hosting places, as I say, do have fiber. I think there was one in Chile that I, I, I've been looking at that does have fiber. Um, I don't know how they manage that, but they do. <laughs> Um, so there's different options. The, the key, the key really is it's, it's the upload speed, not the download speed, which is obviously backwards to what most people want. And it's the ping time. So with the traditional satellite stuff, the pings were like 300, 400 milliseconds. So it's quite stuttery doing remote stuff um, and quite frustrating. Whereas with Starlink and the Habland, it's 20, 30 milliseconds. So it's still more than you would get the UK broadband, but it's, it's manageable. Okay, the, uh, and the most important question from Ian. Um, what sort of ballpark price for one of these small rigs? I, I, I honestly don't know for sure at the moment. Um, we're still trying to, to work it all out. This whole, this whole enclosure too is a complete trial of this business model. Um, uh, it's going to launch later this year, probably later in the summer. Uh, we're just in the process of sending the next five or six rigs over. But what we're trying to work out, and it's, it, it, it's a little bit tricky, which is what is the residual value? It's about a bit like the car leasing. You know, what is the residual value of the kit after two or three years? Because the idea would be that we will change it over every two or three years and sell off the old gear discounted. So, so people, we haven't got to pay off the whole price of that gear, if that makes sense. And it's, it's just fiddling around. That's a very long way of saying I don't know. But ballpark, I really wanted to be around the three, four hundred pound a month range. Um, current hosting just for the space is three or four hundred pounds so what we're hoping to offer is is everything for the price that other people are offering you a space but obviously it's much more modest equipment um so yeah it's, it's obviously it's not for everybody it's not the same as a gym membership or something like that it's not going to suit everybody it's still expensive but comparatively to what the existing options are. I mean, I was looking at some of the image subscription models and for the amount of data we collect in a month could cost you 800, a thousand pounds if you were using one of those image subscription sites. So yeah, that's that's where we're coming up. I don't know if it's gonna work. You know, it might be back in a year's time. It, it, I might have fallen flat on my face, but we'll, we'll see. Nigel? Thank you. Um, yeah, th th thanks very much, Grant. That, that, that's a been a fantastic presentation. I just wanted to ask, um, you, you, you're, are you sending, when you're sending kit out, is, are you sending it uh, basically to Dave yeah. at, at his business address for him to unbox it and install it yeah. and make sure everything is, is working and so on? And also, um, what arrangements do you have for insurance? Okay, so um, th there's, you've got a couple of options with this one. Um, you can, so... We know Dave very well now. We've worked with him for a few years. So we, what we do is we um, take pictures of the rig and we have a very long list of all the bits we're sending and then we send him all the boxes. We don't use a courier. We use what's the equivalent of a man in the van, but there, there's regular man in the van type services that go between the UK and Spain for moving stuff backwards and forwards, generally sort of furniture. And, and the reason we do that is because of the quantity we're sending. That's the cheapest and most efficient way. And it's also a sort of a door-to-door -door service. So it doesn't go to a sorting office and then on a back of a van and then another van. It kind of gets picked up by one guy and eventually he delivers it in the same van to, to Spain. Um, the other option is you you are welcome and, and Dave has visitors. You are welcome to go and stay over at Dave's place. I think he's got a cave house that you can rent from him nearby. Um, and you can take your kid over, you can install it with Dave's help, and you can spend a couple of days there a week there going through that process. And I think a lot of people do that. If it wasn't for COVID, I would have been over there by now. And I'm, I'm still very much looking forward to an opportunity to, to get over there. Um, insurance, we have goods in transit insurance as part of our normal business anyway. So the actual transportation is covered. Insurance when it o is over there is a is non-existent um 
there are no, there's no insurer that we've found that will insure you to put stuff in a building that is opening automatically at night. You know, it's a bit of a um, it's a bit of a tricky one. Um, there's there's obviously very heavy security around the site. Dave is on the site at all times. There's there's all you know all manner of security and barriers. It's in the middle of nowhere, so there is some intrinsic security, but. Uh, I don't know how you would get any sort of insurance for, correct me, someone might know more than me about this, but we have not been able to find sort of an, an insurance suitable for when it's over there. Um, VAT and import duty, this is why we use these man in the van services. Um, it tends to avoid that issue. It's a much simpler way. If you send it by DHL, it's very hard to explain to them and explain to customs that it's still your goods. You're just moving it to Spain temporarily. Um, so we've had, yeah, we, we have had issues with that and we do have issues with that. We, we can claim the VAT back, even if it's Spanish VAT, there's ways of claiming that back. Um, but it can be tricky, which is why it's either easier to try and use one of these sort of man in a van transportation services, which are designed for moving home goods around. So that doesn't have duties and stuff anyway. So if it's your own goods or if you take it over yourself, Flow Europe office, uh, uh, we would like that. Yeah. Um, Absolutely, that would, that would be good fun. Any problems with wildlife? That's a good question. Um, no, that's a very good question. Though. I've never even thought to ask Dave that one. I've never seen anything. Um, so in in with the solar stuff, um, we've also sent over an all sky camera and a sky quality meter. So the idea being, um, we will have a website up for all of this later in the summer. We will have, you'll be able to see live the weather reports the all sky camera the sky quality meter readings so who knows maybe we'll pick something up on that um the other thing we'll have which we've sent over with this this set of equipment is some cameras actually in the enclosures because there's times where i'd really like to know where the heck the thing is actually pointing and whether the flip flat is actually up or not up so we're going to have some cameras just overlooking the whole um the whole enclosures um, so maybe we'll see some some stuff then that'd be that'd be very cool um, yeah, good question though. <laughs> uh, where we what we have had issues with actually is worth mentioning is this um, sandstorms. Um, so there was a sandstorm. Uh, I think it must have been back in May that absolutely coated all the enclosures and was a you know made an absolute mess. It didn't get in the enclosures as such, but as part of what you pay for a remote hosting service, you get so much of Dave's time a month. And part of it is he will clean your gear. He will do a bit of a spring clean and a bit of a dust off. And if you ask him, he will clean your filters for you if you think you need to, to have a clean. Um, so you, it's more than just hosting. It is, it is a sort of, you, you get so much support as well, hands-on technical support. Sometimes it's just, Dave, please, can you pull that USB cable and plug it in again? Um, which happens more often than, than we'd like. Um, and that's very handy. So does Dave have a backup gun? Um, so everything is using UPSs, um, so he doesn't have a backup generator, it's all UPSs. Uh, I don't know whether that's something you'd ever consider, but the UPS, to be honest, like we, I've never seen a power cut, um, so we've never had one that's lasted longer than the UPS can handle. And to be honest, even if you had a generator, I think you would still want the roof to close rather than chance staying on the generator. Um, I, was, I was actually thinking about a backup person. Oh, as well. So yeah. So so um, uh, Dave's family lives over there. So Dave's wife is also involved in the business, and um, and Dave's business partner is Colin, who who is the on-site support for the IC um, Stars remote hosting, which is it's a journey down the road, but it does mean in a pinch they have got some backup between right. them um, and, and things like that. Uh, why I like pollution? That's a really good point. I mean, this is this is what I don't know. Um, I don't think we need them. Um, I think where they're useful is to um, to give you that sort of dual tri narrow band. So that's why I'm using the L Extreme and the MBZ more so than a light pollution. Um, so it's just going after the you know the tighter stars and and to get that you know to, to cut down that bandwidth of what we're capturing. Um, I haven't discounted just using the L Pro just again for a bit of control. Um, it does sort of tidy up a little bit. So whilst there's not light pollution, it can just help with any sort of gradients and if the, the moon's about or whatever. Um, but you're, you're probably right. We, 
you probably could get away with nothing at all over in Spain. Um, yeah, uh, and I have I have tried just with, Z, with 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 an empty filter and just with a UVIR filter on one of the color setups, but I just I just personally I prefer the MBZ so far. Um, but the the idea is that the, so the imaging runs we've done so far. Um, we've split between each of the filters until we make this decision. Once we've decided, right, all we're going to do is L Pro on the color ones, and that's what we'll stick with. And if anyone has any particular requests for filters um, on, on, on their rigs, then we'll, we'll consider that. What we're trying to do, though, is keep the choices to a minimum, because the idea being, if it's all the same kit, obviously there's economies of scale, but also we will have spares over in Spain. So if a camera does fail, rather than you know, your rig be out of action, we will just swap the kit over, which if it's all the same, um, makes that much easier. Um, I mean, th th there's all, there's some other interesting things, which is we didn't know the Arctron 740 would be suitable for remote for, for a remote observatory because it's not, let's, let's be frank, it's not the kind of mount you would ever intrinsically think, I'm gonna stick that in a in an observatory somewhere. It's a, it's a portable, you know, star party back garden mount. It's a very good mount for, for its purpose, but we had no idea if the software would be good enough to run remotely 24 hours a day. And so far, it's been very pleasantly surprising in that it's been it's been bulletproof. Um, any northern constellations targets you can't reach? Um, excuse me, well, one, one I'm really struggling to reach um, and I'd really like to get is Triffid. I should be able to reach it there. It's low here. It's not quite as low there, but because of this issue that the roof has to be able to close at all times, it does mean the, the, the walls are higher than you might do if it was in your back garden observatory, for example, where you know you're always going to park the mount out of the way before you close the roof. So it means we can't eat, you can't reach anything below about 20 degrees altitude. So it does cut off, even though they, they, they might be easier to get in that, that further south, um, it does cut off your horizons a little bit. Um, the other object I've been trying to get is Oh, uh, God. What's it called? Uh, it's very low down. Looks like an eye. Someone's going to know the name of it, and I just can't get to it. Um, no, it's totally gone. Um, and it's just it's just the, 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 the walls are in the way. Um, and I think that might also become an issue for some of the planetary stuff. Um, I don't know if all remote observatories are designed like that, but they tend to be roll off roof. You don't tend to see a dome used remotely because you can only fit one set up in a dome. Um, and, and obviously a roll off roof is a much simpler design. Will, is there any, are there any questions on YouTube? Um, yes, just uh, just got one really from um, Zeta Crucis. And she's actually, well, they're saying who can actually use Icarus and when will it become available? I know you sort of touched on it a bit, but what yeah. are you aiming? Are you aiming for? Yeah, yeah so use i i had this um very utopian idea that we would actually give people just used to it and the reality is from a security point of view and everything else that's quite a challenge so what i've tended to do is um sessions where i will work with a society and i'll control it but kind of let them choose what objects we look at and talk over me so a sort of uh, a, a lead session um what we've done through stargazers lounge is is we had votes for what objects to go after next um so it, it was sort of collaborative in that sense i don't know a good way to give people complete direct access without somebody from here being involved in that um just because it, there is a, obviously a risk there um so it, yeah um i think the next step would be to allow some of the other sort of admin team of sgl to have access um uh, some of my colleagues have access and you'll probably know some of some of my colleagues from the outreach stuff they do so again people like Dave Eagle who works for us I'm hoping he may be able to use it for some of the outreach stuff he does so I'm hoping it sort of gradually expands beyond just me um, it isn't just me at the moment it's me and, and Rob in our workshop who use it the most so I'm hoping it expands from there but also you know for example tonight if we can I'll happily do some live stacking with, with you guys some live viewing um, if we're up for staying up that late um, or invite me back later in the winter and we can do some sessions remotely and, and give you access that way. Um, part of it is there's a training element. You know, you can't just log in and away you go. You've got to understand 
Secret Generator Pro and how we've got the software set up. So there isn't, you know, there's a little bit of a barrier to entry. Um, and, and obviously that, that security aspect as well. Um, I don't, I don't think there's any damage anyone could do by deliberately trying to, you know, hit the scope somewhere, but I wouldn't want to uh, test that theory. Absolutely. And, and just, uh, I was just thinking about your um, starting the solar observation. I think that's going to be really challenging with the heat. Would you kind of look at maybe just doing from something like seven to 10 in the morning or something like that? And maybe yeah. painting everything white for your pillars and stuff like this? Absolutely. I, I think this is this is why that what that particular part of it is such an unknown, because I don't know of a remote solar observatory like this. Um, it may be that it just doesn't work. It may be that it, it's too much of a compromise to our nighttime scopes. So the backup plan is to consider putting a, a, a traditional sort of um, dome observatory in just for the solar stuff so we can keep it independent. And that may well be the next step. I don't know. Um, we're also looking to see if we can just half open the roof so that the remaining setups are at least in the shade um, but as you say, this may be an issue, and particularly in the summer in Spain, it's hot enough with the roofs closed. It may be we have to restrict the hours we do it. Um, it may be more of a winter thing. We just don't know. But it's it's part of the process. I think unless we try it, we're, we're not going to know. Um, and, and it's the type of thing I think, you know, we've, we've speculated, should we put the computers in a refrigerated box of some kind should we have the computers in the other observatory and just have a long cable so there's lots of things we will we'll have to look at um i'm not sure whether we've done enough in in the way of shielding the other telescopes so we're going to have to look at that very carefully um but it, it is going to be a challenge and i think we will probably need some 3d printed or probably not 3d printed because they're probably gonna struggle in the heat but some parts to shade the cameras on the solar telescope as well so when it is in use so we're going to be taking this very carefully, um, as you can imagine, and, Absolutely. Uh, and see Absolutely. where we get. I'm, I mean, I, I, can, I remember in, just in spring on a sunny day in Scotland, if you have your laptop out in the sun, it can fry it, you know, so yeah. let alone Spain in summer. Yes, yeah, no, it's it, there, there is definitely a risk here. Um, I, I, I think I'm probably fixating upon the, um, the data side as well, in that just in an hour's solar session, you can generate hundreds of gigabytes of data now. So this this will also play into this that we we can't we can't run it for five six hours a day because the sheer amount of data we're going to generate and also I, I think at some point what is the value of that data if 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 nothing is changing or there's nothing different you know so it may be that we we're very picky about when we capture how we capture what we capture um and i'm hoping some of the um scripting stuff in sharp cap is going to help us so what the rotarian team have done recently is that the Rotarian now shows up as a filter wheel in SharpCap. So actually we can, when we're creating a sequence, we can select the different quark in the same way as you would select a filter. So hopefully we can actually automate the workflow. Because again, this is the other side of this. We haven't got the luxury of sitting there all day controlling it. Um, so it's going to have, there's going to have to be some degree of automation um, for the solar stuff, or it will only get used on specific times and dates. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's very new. Um, let's uh, see, see what happens, but hopefully it won't melt. <laughs> it's, it's just say it's been very well enjoyed the presentation by YouTube viewers. Oh, Excellent, too. Grant. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much for that. Uh, that was fantastic. And th thank you very much, Grant, for the talk. Thank you. Um, I think we're just going to go off YouTube just now, and then we'll just have a, a quick chat about, about what we might, might do next. So I'll just turn that off. So thank you.